Hope it's been a good day. All 12 of us that are here. <laughs> there might be 12 of us here, but there's, there's 100 out there watching, right? So that's, that's a good thing. Well, we're going to sing a little bit tonight. We're going to sing the first and the last stanza as we start with, Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. It should be up on the screen. And so let's start with a song and then we'll have prayer. Wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. That's a song that'll get your blood pumping a little bit, don't you think, Dwayne? I think so. I think so. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather here and to gather together via the internet, Lord, and to just be surrounded by your presence and your word. We just thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have tonight to worship. We thank you for the salvation that we have through your Christ. And Lord, we just thank you that there's no sin that was too great that Jesus couldn't save us from. And Lord, we just thank you that today we come before you as saved, blood-washed people. We thank you so much for all that you've done for us, all that you've given to us, all that you will give to us, and all that you will do for us in the future. We thank you that heaven is a sure deal for us. And so God, we just pray tonight that you might just fix our minds upon your word, help us to hear what it tells us, and help us to, help us to trust it, and walk in a way that's always pleasing to you. And so, Lord, we give you this night, as we give you not just night in our life, but this night for the rest of our lives as you seek to glorify yourself in each one of us. Lord, we love you. We look forward to what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we sing our next song, I just a couple quick announcements. Uh, there's going to be a trustee meeting coming up uh, this coming Tuesday at 630. So if you are a trustee, take a note of that, 630. We'll probably meet in a chapel, I'm guessing. And so make sure, guys, you have the air on because it gets warm in here in the evenings. Also, uh, several people, we have about 100 people that have made pledges uh, for Joel Madasu. I take that back. We have $100 that have been pledged. I don't know. We have about maybe 8 to 10 people that have made pledges. That's better. Cindy's shaking her head. No, that's wrong. And see, I, I need you here because I get so confused sometimes. I know I need to listen to myself more often. Is that how that goes? But anyway, we've had about $100 that have been pledged uh, out of the 600. And so I've talked to, well, I haven't talked to Joel. We've texted back and forth a little bit today to see what's the best way for him to receive the money. And so as soon as we find out for sure, I'll let everybody know. So it's just wonderful to be able to do that. Do you realize that our church has an opportunity to help him reach 60 million people? 
Do you ma can you imagine how big of a number that is? We don't think that way because we have so many different television places all over the country. Each city has their own. But India is a little bit different. And so he has an opportunity to reach 60 million people with the gospel. And uh, I don't think we can really fathom that. But to be able to be part of that, to be able to take the gospel and to help him take the gospel and speak in a language that none of us can speak, uh, to be able to do that is a marvelous thing that we can be part of. And what it costs those that participate in it is just $10 a month. You know, it's like a McDonald's meal or maybe just a night, even a night out uh, for you. It's, it's not that much money. And we talked about praying and fasting, the idea of not eating, focusing our attention on God. And that's a good way to do it. Just once a month, skip a meal and focus your attention and pray. Ask God's mercy on Joel. As he preaches the gospel, give him opportunities, let the people be able to have open ears to hear what he has to say and to be part of that. And for some people, that's a sacrificial thing. I think that $10 is a lot of money for some folks. But then again, if you think about it, when we talk about faith promise giving, what we're talking about is you're trusting the Lord for $10. You say, Lord, I'm going to give $10. Now you have to give it to me. And as he gives you the $10, you give it for that ministry. And so that's something that we can all be part of. Again, that's walking by faith and not by sight. Amen? And I think it would be wonderful if we, had, if we could get all of our church, if we had 60 people from our church particularly that could do that, maybe for a while. But it would be exciting to be part of that ministry for a while. I know that he has had a difficult time raising funds where he's at uh, because he's working for ABC in that ministry. But uh, we just need to pray for him and pray that the door stays open and gives him an opportunity to continue to preach the gospel there in India. All right, we're going to sing another song. If you have your hymn books, you can use it. It'll be on the screen, 412, Draw Me Nearer. Draw Me Nearer. We'll sing the first and we'll sing the last stanza. for playing for us. I was going to say ladies, but that, that's not right, is it there? No, it's not right, so I'm glad I didn't say that. We have wonderful people who can play for us in our church. We're blessed. We're blessed. All right, Michael, I'm ready. Let's open our Bibles to Psalm 13. We began the sermon last week, but I'm going to re repeat part of the first part of it to you because... <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people don't remember what we talked about. We had a business meeting last week, so everybody's kind of out of kilter a little bit, trying to hurry to get things done, get things arranged. And uh, so let's just go back and see what the Lord has for us, because I really do think that this is a very important message. And as we begin it, let me just prefix my remarks by simply saying, when we talk about many of the Psalms, we're talking about people that have a living relationship with Jesus. They, they're born again people. They have an intimate, personal relationship with, with God. And so when we go through this psalm today, this psalm is really geared for those people that have that type of relationship. But if you're here tonight or you're watching via the Internet and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you don't have that personal, intimate relationship with him, then this psalm isn't really for you. 
We talk about, you know, how long, O oh Lord, being, God being silent, us not hearing from God. Well, unless you get saved, God's not going to hear from you. And so there's no reason not to be saved. I mean, just look outside. Everybody know that there's a God. Isn't that right, Mike? I know you, you've been teaching that a lot in Sunday school. We know that there's a God. Only a fool says in his heart that there's no God because the obvious proof is there for all men to see. Plus, God placed it within us, according to Romans chapter 1. We all know that there is something greater than ourselves. And so I would challenge you, if you're not saved here tonight, or if you're not saved watching via the Internet, to think about the claims of Christ and to accept him as your Savior before it's too late. Because judgment is coming. And I do believe that this COVID-19 virus has been a... Uh, maybe a, an awakening for the American church as we realize how close we could come to a pandemic that could wipe out millions of us. You know, we've been very fortunate with this. And uh, we just need to remember and thank God because I think there's coming a time, I know in the book of Revelation, there's coming a time, Revelation 6 talks about pestilence coming. And this is a pestilence in that sense. And so we're very fortunate that God has given us a reprieve I would say so far up to this point, but I don't know what the future holds. But I do know that I don't know from one day to the next whether I'm going to be alive. And that's true for all of us. And so the best thing to do if you're not saved is to be saved and be saved today. And if you do accept Christ as your Savior, don't keep it a secret. Make sure you tell somebody. And uh, I would love to hear, you know, you think about the, the millions of spirit beings that are in heaven with the Lord. Uh, and the Bible tells us that the angels rejoice when one person accepts Christ. Can you imagine what that would sound like? Have all these angels everywhere just rejoicing over you, accepting Christ as your Savior. I think that's, that's exciting. So let's look at Psalm 13 tonight. Psalm 13. And what we talked about last week, and let me just remind you a little bit, we talked about the idea of God being silent. You're going through a difficult time, and instead of getting better, it gets worse. And you pray and you ask God and you, you ask God and you beseech God, but still you get a silent answer from God. And you wonder where he is. What is he doing? Is he not listening to me? Does he not love me? Does he not care about what I'm going through? And you know that's not true because the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves you so much that he gave Jesus his son from eternity into time to die upon that cross so we could have eternal life, so we could be with him forever. So are you not important to God? Yes, you are very important to God. But we get those times that we wonder where God is. And sometimes we just pray and we just think that it's just our voice that we hear. There's nothing else that's with it. So let's read the first six verses from Psalm chapter 13. How long, O Lord? Question mark. Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. If you notice this, there's a progression here in these verses. He goes from identifying a problem in the first two verses, talking about prayer, and this simply talking about rejoicing at the end. And so I think there are times in all of our lives when we pray and we seem to be missing his presence in our life. Again, let me just prefix that with a thought that you already know. God has promised never to leave you, never to forsake you. He's going to be with you always, even to the end of the age. And so when you die, he's going to be with you. John 14 tells us, you know, that he's going to prepare a place for us, and he will come again, and he will receive us unto himself, that where he is, there we might be also. And so there's coming a time that we will never be outside of the care of the Lord. He cares about us. And there are times when I pray and I can sense his presence right there. Is that true for you too? And there's times that I pray and I don't sense his presence in my life. And many times, it's, is it God that has drifted away? No, it's not God that's drifted away at all. It's, it's me that's drifted away. And so tonight, I think I want you to help go through this text with me and understand how God works in times when he seems to be not available, when he's not around. 
But remember this as we think about it. It starts out, how long, O Lord? How long? And it may be that we want God to change that problem, that circumstance, that situation that we're in. So we ask that question, how long, Lord? But God doesn't always change our circumstances, does he? I would say very seldom sometimes does he change our circumstances. What God changes is us as we go through that circumstance. And so God wants to work on us, the person, and not always the problem. Can God change the problem? Well, sure, God can change the problem because God can do whatever God wants to do. But sometimes it's best for us to go through that trial, that tribulation that's coming into our life. And so let's look and see about the prevailing problem that David is talking about. And I think, again, it's interesting that David, who was a man after God's own heart, felt that he was forsaken by God. You know, if David can be forsaken by God, what hope do we have? And so I think we're in good company sometimes. You know, it's interesting in the first two verses, four times you see how long. If you have your pens out, go ahead and circle those. He says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Then he says again, how long will you hide your face from me? You can circle that one. Verse 2, how long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? And then he concludes in verse 2 by saying, how long will my enemy be exalted over me? And so David is talking about a persistent problem that he seems to be getting absolutely no help from the Lord. You know, he's saying, Lord, it's been a long time, and I got this persistent problem, and it's a nagging problem, and it's not going away. Why don't you do something about it for me? <coughs> and he's hearing what? Silence. He's hearing silence. One of the things that we forget about God is God's not in a hurry. We are in a hurry. We're McDonald's people, aren't we not? I mean, let's face it. How many of you have pulled into McDonald's lot sometime and you found four or five cars there and you just went around them and went home? Anybody? Could I have a glass of water, please? I'm dry. <coughs> I don't know about you, but I've been having a lot of sinus problems, so I think we're having a lot of allergies floating around out there. I don't think I have anything. I think I'm pretty sure it's allergies. But we want people, we are people that want, want it now. And we hate to wait for anything. And so you have to realize that because of our thinking like that, we have created a God after our own making. We expect a God to answer our every whim, our every call. Whenever we want something, we expect him to be right there, right now, fixing whatever it is that we want him to fix. But God's not like that. God's not like that at all. One of the things you can learn about God is that God is not in a hurry. He's just not in a hurry. We are in a hurry all the time, but God's not always in a hurry. Let me give you a couple places. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6. Keep your finger there in Psalm 13, but go to Revelation chapter 6. In Revelation chapter 6, the seals are opened, but we get to verse 9, and the Bible says, Thank you, Michael. Verse 9 says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. These are martyrs. They have been slain for their faith. Amen? Could that be us? No. Well, technically it could be. I think these were ones killed during the tribulation period. We're going to be raptured before the tribulation period comes. Verse 10, and they cried with a loud voice saying, how long? There again, how long? How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? How long, they're saying, how long? And of course, God doesn't answer their prayer right away because the tribulation period has to run, run its time. But see, God's not always in a hurry. God can't be rushed. God's on a timetable. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he will always be on time for everything that he desires to do. I remember that I spoke last week about the woman that came out to meet Christ that had a nagging problem with an issue of blood. You remember the story? She had it for 18 years. Don't you think that sometime during those 18 years, Gary, that she probably said, How long, O Lord, do I have to keep this up? I mean, how long do I have to have this? Why don't you intervene and, and take care of this and fix it? I mean, 
Is not our God a God of miracles? He just is. But I think that she was wondering how long. And then, of course, you had the man laying at the, the pool of Bethesda. And every time the water moved, you remember the story? Every time the water moved, they put somebody in the water and said when the angel moved the water that the person would be healed. And the man said, I have nobody to put me in the water. He'd been that way for 38 years. And I'm sure sometime in his life he was wondering the same thing that we all wonder. Why? Why me? Why now? If God is God and he loves his people, why am I going through what I'm going through? But did God have a plan? Sure. God have a program? Sure. Did it involve this man? Yeah, absolutely. So the man went for 38 years so God would be glorified. So God would be glorified. And so I think that man prayed the same thing. That the woman with the issue of blood prayed, that David was praying, that the martyrs were praying. How long, O oh Lord, till you do something about the problem that we're in? Well, when we go back to Psalm 13, flip back there, I see that David has the same thing. Uh, the same, the problem is threefold for him as it was for all three of these other people that we've looked at. First of all, it says, if look at verse 1, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? David felt, David felt forgotten. David felt forgotten. You know, when you're having a good time, time goes by quickly, doesn't it? And when you're having a bad time, it just kind of ekes by. You know, and that's why we start wondering where God is, because we're thinking about all these different things. But here, let me just remind you that God has not forgotten us. We think sometimes that God has forgotten us. That's our flesh creeping in, because our flesh has created a God that we expect him to answer our prayers right then and right there and give us exactly what we ask for. And when God says no or God says wait, we don't like that at all. But if you think this evening that God has forgotten you, just remember that he hasn't forgotten you. No matter where you are or what you're going through, God has not forgotten you. He has told us in his word, I will never leave you. He knows exactly what's going on in your life. I will never forsake you, but I'll be with you always. Those are a verse, that's a verse that we all know, but it's a verse that we should apply to our hearts constantly because when we go through those issues, we go through those problems, and we do feel left out, we do feel alone, we do feel forgotten sometimes. This wasn't the first time that David said, you forgot me. If you look at Psalm 42, verse 9, he says the same thing. He says, why have you forgotten me? Why have you forgotten me, God? Where have you been? And so if David can go through these difficult things, trust me, He's just a person just like the rest of us. We're going to be going through those things as well. <coughs> but I mentioned to you last week a couple of things that God has forgotten. And we should be glad of it. One of the things that God has forgotten is our sins. For us born again people. For those of us that are saved. Now if you're not saved, God hasn't forgotten your sins. He, <coughs> he knows all about them. It says in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12. I will remember their sins against them no more. I will remember their iniquities, their sins against them no more. So you say to yourself, well, can God forget anything? Well, God doesn't forget anything. God just doesn't hold those things against us anymore. That's kind of what that means when he says he doesn't remember our sins. But when God sees our sin, he doesn't hold it against us because our sins are forgiven because of the blood of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was on the cross so long ago, and that was a long time ago, he bore in his body our sins, which were 2,000 years in the future. He bore our sins upon the cross, and he paid our sin debt, past, present, and future, for our lives in full. And so when the Father sees us today, he doesn't see Tim Dillon's sinfulness. He sees Tim Dillon's righteousness because he sees the holiness of his son that has been placed to my account. And so when God sees me, he sees a righteous person. A holy person. And so God doesn't judge my sins anymore. And so my God hasn't forgotten me because he remembers not to judge my sins anymore because I am in Christ. And Paul talked, he used that little phrase over and over and over and over. And speaking of his relationship with God, I am in Christ. I am in Christ. Let me look at another verse with you. Uh, Isaiah chapter 49. Go ahead and keep your finger there in Psalm 13. <coughs> Go to Isaiah. Verse 
49. I, was, I don't know if it was last Sunday or the Sunday before last that I was, I was talking, Mike, and all of a sudden I just started squeaking. That's a bad sign, isn't it? When you're preaching and you can't talk. Isaiah chapter 49. And let's look at verse 14. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. Israel's thinking God has forsaken him. And my Lord has forgotten me. And then it says, can a woman forget her nursing child? Well, not hardly. And not have compassion on the son of her womb. Surely they may forget. So it's possible, I guess, for a woman to forget that. I think it would be very difficult. But we live in a day and age today where it's not as difficult as we say it is. Aborting babies up to the, the day that they're born. What has happened to our country today? What has happened to our culture? What's happened to our people? And then he says this. Verse, uh, end of verse 15. <clears throat> Yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. This is pause there. He's inscribed his people on the palms of his hands. Kind of the idea of a tattoo, if you will. But let me give you another, probably a better illustration for us to think of. You know, when you see Jesus, one of the ways you're going to be able to identify him is the, the print of the nails in his hands. You know, I think this is going to be open. There they are. I'm, I'm there. You can see it in the book of Revelation. He's described as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So I think Jesus <coughs> will bear those marks for all eternity, showing God's grace to all of us. And so when we think that God has forsaken us, that God has forgotten us, we'll talk about being forsaken in a minute, but God has forgotten us, you just remember that he, it says here very plainly, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. I like that, don't you? His hands are always there. And where are we all the way? According to John chapter 10. We are in the Father's hands and we are in Christ's hands. He always sees us. He knows what's going on in our lives. He knows what's going on in your life personally. So David was wrong. It seems strange to say that, Dwayne. Here's a great man of God and we can say that David was wrong when he thought that God had forsaken him. But he gets it right, I think, in Psalm 27, verse 10, when he says this, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. And so, you know, we all go through those times that we whine and whimper. Is that true? Dwayne, are you a whiner and a whimper? No, I didn't think you were. You didn't, you didn't impress me as that kind of guy. I would ask my wife if I was, but the truth of it is that we don't want to go there either. But the Lord's going to take care of us. And I like that verse, Psalm 27, because it says the Lord will take care of who? Me. Now, David's talking to himself, but I think I can squeeze me into that verse, don't you? And you can squeeze you into that verse. That he's going to take care of, of you. He's going to take care of you. So David felt forgotten. Was that true? No, he wasn't forgotten at all. But David also felt forsaken. Let's go back to Psalm 13. <clears throat> he says, how long will you hide your face from me? How long will you hide your face from me, O oh God? Wow. David felt like God had turned his back totally on him, that he didn't care for him anymore. God never turns his back on you. I mentioned last week that sometimes we think that we commit a terrible sin. And sometimes we do commit terrible sins, don't we? Don't we? You want to confess yours? No. no. But we all commit sins. And sometimes when we commit something like that, we think that God holds that against us. Well, has it pleased the Lord? Well, no, it hasn't pleased the Lord at all. But my sins are forgiven. What I have done is destroyed, at least for a moment in time, my fellowship with God. And that should bother me. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'm saved. I, you know, I have fire insurance. No matter what comes into my life, I know I'm going to heaven because I trusted Jesus as my Savior. But if you truly have trusted Jesus as your Savior, it impacts and influences your life. You become a different person, become a new creature in Christ. Old things pass away, behold, all things become new. You have a desire now to please your Heavenly Father. He's done some marvelous things for you, some great things for you. And God is never going to hold a grudge against you. I mean, think about how putrid you were before you were saved. I mean, we were outside of the fellowship of God. We were sinners, and the wages of sin is what? Death. Eternal separation from God forever. He couldn't stand to have us around. But then he saved us. 
And we acknowledged that truth. We came to him in repentance and faith, and God gave us salvation. God doesn't hold a grudge against us anymore. He just doesn't. And God always turns his face toward his people. I like what it says here. I read it last week. Let me read it again. Numbers 6, Numbers chapter 6, verses 20 through 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give you peace. Deuteronomy 6 tells us that, you know, when we rise up and we sit down, we should be teaching our children the things of God. We have failed in that dramatically as a people. Our kids are wayward. Our kids aren't interested in spiritual things as a whole. And we can point fingers at the church, but I think probably the most places, and I probably make enemies here, it's not my intention to make anybody angry, but the, the problem is that we have failed our children. In some way or the other, all of us have failed our children because we have allowed the world that has crept into our lives to impact how we raised our children. And uh, we, we surrendered sometimes things that should never have been surrendered. And we should have imposed a love for Christ in their life. So when difficult things come into their life, they can always go back and trust the Lord. Because let's face it, you and I aren't going to be around forever, are we? Our kids get old enough, they make their own choices. And we hope that we have given them enough education, enough instruction, that when that difficult time comes, when they have to make that choice, they can make a godly choice. They can make that godly choice. And even if you brought up your children the best you can, we all have, but you did your very best, you still get to that time when you might have a wayward child because they still choose. They still choose. Here David in the psalm is thinking that God has forgotten him, that, they, that God was hiding his face from him. You know, he, he's saying, I don't, I don't sense your presence in my life. You're not shining on me. I don't see your countenance there. It's just not there. So he was felt forsaken. But does God ever forsake us? No. Where does that thought come from? Well, two places I would say off the top of my head. First, it comes from my flesh. Because I'm not getting from God what I desire to get from God. My problem solved. My life to be happy and great. Does God want us to be happy? First and foremost, God wants us to be holy. And that's not, happiness doesn't always fit in there in that sense. But joy does. Joy is an inward happiness, you could say. Happiness is an outward manifestation of an inward joy. And so we should be a joyful people. And many times in our life, there's not going to be things to be happy about. Look at the apostles. They were martyred for their faith. You think they were happy going to the chopping block to have their, their head removed? I don't believe they were happy about it because they're just like the rest of us. They want to hang around a while. But there was great joy because they knew who they were serving. And they knew who they were, who they were dying for. They were dying for their Lord. And so David felt forgotten, David felt forsaken, and David was very frustrated. Because it says, and if you look in verse 2 of chapter 13 of Psalms, How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? You know, we try to reason out these things. We try to fix these things ourselves. We try to handle our problem ourselves. But the problem just can't be solved. Or at least it can't be solved the way that we want it solved, but we, we go to God because God is a sovereign God and God can fix it. But God doesn't always fix it. And we get frustrated. But when you go through a difficult circumstance, a difficult trial that comes into your life, let me give you some verses that you need to jot down. And these are verses that you know. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, the Bible tells us, being confident of this very thing, he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So when I'm going through a difficult thing and I felt forsaken, I feel forgotten, I'm frustrated over the problem that I'm in, I need to remember that what God has begun in me is a marvelous work. And he's going to finish it. He's going to complete it. And you need to remember Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Because I love it. Being confident. I'm confident. I don't know what's going on in my life, but God knows I trust him. Being confident of this very thing, that he that has begun a good work in you will perform it. He's going to finish it. God will complete what God starts. 
God doesn't have any half-built towers, half-built buildings. He's going to finish what he started. How about Romans chapter 8, verse 28? And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, right? Who are the called according to his purpose. And so I love God. I'm the called according to his purpose. So all good things aren't always good things in your life. Death comes, sorrow comes, sickness comes. All kinds of things come that we would say aren't very good things. But he says, and we know that all things work together for good, not that all things are good. So God is working in us. And we can see that in this, in this psalm. He goes from having a difficult problem to prayer. And we're going to look at just in a second, one of the things that our perplexing problems bring to us is the desire for praying. And many times that's exactly why God brings problems into our life. Because we have become a prayerless people. Until, until that comes. That time comes when it's too big for us to handle. He goes on to say in verse 29 of Romans chapter 8, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So God's not through with you. God's not through with you. And he's not through with us. He has a plan for all of us. It says in Psalm 138, verse 8, The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. That word, that word that's given to us, perfect, means to finish, to complete. Now, we may not like, God, like God's timing. We may not like God's method that he's going to do, but we still cry out to our God, and he's going to do whatever he wants to do. And what we have to say is thank you. No matter what difficulty comes into my life, no matter how bad it is, you know, I still have a home in heaven that can never be taken away from me. You know, so I have a difficulty in this life for 38 years, like that man did at the porch there, wanting to get put in the water. I'm going to have 38 years of eternity sometime in the future that are mine forever. A God who loves me so much, he came to earth and died in my place and paid a debt I could never pay so I could come and live with him forever. That's an awesome thought. God wants me. But when I look in the mirror at me, I'm not real happy all the time at what I see. You know? I'm a people. And people have a problem. You know what that problem is? We sin against God still today. I like to consider myself to be a saint. Instead of a you know, sinner saved by grace, that's true. But I'm, a, I'm not a sinner anymore. I'm a saint who sins. There's a big difference between those two. And so we see a prevailing problem, but we have a prevailing prayer. Look at verses 3 and 4. So he goes and says, How long, Lord? You forgot me. You've forsaken me. And I'm frustrated over the whole issue. And then, verse 3 and 4, he begins to change his tune, change his attitude. One of the things we all need to have is an attitude adjustment sometimes. And God's good at giving us those things sometimes. Even when we didn't think we needed one, Aubrey, he gives us one. And that's, we're not happy about that, but he does it that way. Look what it says in verse 3 and 4. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him. Let those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. And so he talked about a perplexing problem. Now he wants to talk about this concept of prevailing prayer. And I think here in these two verses, he condenses a lot of things that have been going on in his life. Problems that were there drove him to praying. I think David was just like us. He went through difficult times that were overwhelming for him. And it took those difficult times for him to see that he needed God. And those difficult times drove him to seek out the Lord. And that's why many times God brings difficult things into our life is to teach us to talk to him. The help that we need is right there. The help that we need literally is right here because he lives within us. The problems that David had drove him to, drove him to pray. And it wasn't just here in Psalm 13. I said he did it again in Psalm 42. He felt the same way. So I think it was something that happened frequently in David's life, just like it happens in our life that we feel forsaken. But, but notice to whom he prays. He says, consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. You know, Yahweh, 
the covenant-keeping God, and then Elohim, the Almighty. I like that. He's the, the God who keeps his promises. That's what Elway is about. And then you have the, the I'm going to sneeze. I'm trying not to. You have, you have El, Yahweh, who is the, the covenant-keeping God. And then you have this, this idea of Elohim, who's the Almighty One. And so you have a, a, a God who keeps his covenants, and you have a God who's Almighty. So David's acknowledging both of those. That's a good thing. Now, when was the last time that you acknowledged God, he keeps his covenant? He made a covenant with you. Do you realize that? He made a covenant with you when you accepted his son as your Lord and Savior, your master. He gave you eternal life, a covenant that can never be changed. You become engraven on God's hands. He remembers you always. He never forgets who you are. And so when that problem is coming into your life, rest assured that God knows about it. And he has the ability to take care of that problem because he is the almighty one. He is God. And so what David is saying, remember me, O God, the God that keeps a covenant, the God that can do anything. You're the, the one Lord that can do it all. We need to remember who it is that we pray to. We forget that sometimes. You see, here's David. He's probably running away from Saul. Saul gave him a hard time. Thinking that Saul is trying to kill him. But, you know, God made a promise to David, didn't he? He was anointed. King in Israel. But he hadn't been crowned king in Israel yet. And so was Saul ever going to kill David? No. I wonder if David ever reflected upon that, that God made a promise to him, the next king in Israel, and he's hiding, not trusting the Lord. Has that ever happened to you? God has given, given you all these promises, and you hide yourself from his presence sometimes. That's what David was doing. To get a promise from God... You have to pray on the basis of who God is and what God can do. And what God will say he will do. You know, you think about what David went through there. He should have trusted the Lord more. But he didn't trust the Lord more. Because he was a man just like the rest of us, a person. We need to... To take our emotions sometimes, and it's our emotions that drives us away from God because we feel that he's forsaken us. We feel that he's forgotten us. And we need to take those emotions and we have to nail those to the promises of God. Because God's promises never change. But my situation and my problems are always changing. So whatever it happens to be that's driving me nuts, I just simply need to take those things and nail those to the promises of God because God always keeps his promises. Because God always keeps his word. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 tells us, Be anxious for nothing. We'll get to that here in the next week or so in Philippians. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard, literally will garrison, your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ our Lord. It doesn't say that God's going to solve your problems. It doesn't say that at all. It says God will give you peace and that God will do those things that he said that he's going to do because God keeps his what? Keeps his word, keeps his promises. And so we had a perplexing problem that led to a perplexing prayer. Now, if you look at the last couple of verses here, verses 5 and 6, we see a proper perspective. It's just taken him the most of the psalm to get to it. But I have trusted in your mercy, <coughs> David writes. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. <coughs> now, what has changed in David's life? Problem's still there, but he's prayed. Remember I said that God doesn't change our situations. What he does is change us. That's exactly what's happened here in the psalm. God has changed David. How did God change David? Because David set his problems aside. Those situations, those things that were overwhelming. And he nailed those to God's promises. 
and he began to talk to God and refresh that relationship that he had with him. <clears throat> David had changed. And so it's the same guy that was whining and crying up in the first couple of verses, and now he's praising God. You know, I think what he says is, you know, I've looked at the problem, I've been overwhelmed by the problem, and hey, God, I'm just going to forget about the problem, and I'm going to get my eyes off the problem, and I'm going to put my eyes on you. That's where we always fail. We always continue to linger and stare at the situation and the problems that we have without putting our eyes on the one who can take care of the problems that we wrestle with. Yahweh, the God of gods, he is God. He can do it. We just have to trust him. We just have to learn to trust him. Look what it says, <clears throat> verse 5, but. That's a big word. All the things that he's gone through, he says, but I have trusted in your mercy. I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Let me just give you three things I see here in these last couple of verses and we'll be finished. But one, par one paraphrase that I had read when it says, but I have trusted in your mercy, says, I have thrown myself headlong into thine arms. Isn't that great? We don't think that way. We don't write that way. We don't talk that way. But sometimes we need to do that, do that. And so let me give you a couple things that I see here. Number one, it says, but I have trusted in your mercy. David had unshakable faith. He might have went through a difficult time. He might have been tried, but he had unshakable faith. Unshakable faith. I have trusted in your mercy. Did God's mercy ever fail, David? Did God's mercy ever fail you? Does God's grace ever fail? Never. So not only does David write about unshakable faith, but he's talking here also about unspeakable joy. Look at verse 5 again. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I mean, if you think about it, if you're saved, if you're a child of God, you've got more to rejoice in than anything else. No matter what comes, we ought to be a rejoicing people. Amen? Yeah, I'm going to die tomorrow, but praise God, what do I have before me? You guys get to go to the cemetery. You guys get to go to the funeral. But I get heaven. And you can't even begin to comprehend what I'm seeing. You're whining and crying around my box. I'm not here. I'm seeing almighty God. I'm seeing things that we can't even begin to describe. I'm seeing those things. I'll tell you. We should have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Because that's really what it's all about. We have so much to rejoice in, no matter what it is. The Bible says in Romans 8, 18, this is Paul talking again. This is something that he understood. He says, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Man, someday I'm going to shine like the sun. You will too. You will too. I don't think he's just talking about dying here. I don't think he's talking about salvation. When it talks about, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation, he's just talking about being delivered. I can say, praise God, I've been, I've been saved, right? I've been delivered from my sins, but I've also been delivered from circumstances and problems. If I have the right perspective. And David has shown us the right perspective. He went from being overwhelmed by the problem to prayer and now to praise. And that has, that's how it has to be with us. And then the last one, unquenchable praise. I will sing unto the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. You know, here's a man who's saying, Lord, I'm about to die. My, my problems are overwhelming me. But then he gets his mind off his problems. He gets his mind on God. He begins to focus on God. He begins to focus on the blessings that God has given to him. And he says, wow, you have dealt bountifully with me. God, you didn't answer my prayer like I wanted you to. You didn't take this circumstance or this situation away from me like I wanted you to. But David said, hey, you know what, Lord? You have dealt bountifully with me. That's a change of attitude, change of heart. I don't care how big your problem is this evening. But if you will begin to think about the blessings that God will give you, you'll have to say that God has dealt bountifully with me. Amen? Let's pray. 
Our Father, our Lord, I have preached to my own heart tonight. And Lord, I pray that those that are listening that have big, great burdens on their hearts, who feel be, that they're being crushed beneath the weight of those things, I pray, Father God, that they might turn their eyes away from the circumstances and the problems and turn their eyes to you, focus their attention on you. Yahweh, the, the covenant-keeping God, Elohim, the Almighty One, who can take care of anything and has taken care of things, we're children of God. You walk with us. You talk with us. You are with us always. Help us not to give up hope. Help us not to lose sight of who you are. Help us to always rejoice in praise for the blessings that we have each and every day. Help us to fill our hearts and our minds with your word. Help us to fill our mouths with prayer and praise. And help us to do the things that glorify you the most. Because we have a God who isn't going to forget us, is never going to forsake us. And even though we go through frustrations, we have a God who's going to help us through that, as he did David. And so we see the problem, and we can push it aside, and we begin to pray. And as we begin to pray, it leads us to praise. So, Father God, help us to become a people of praise tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for coming. Thanks for watching. I hope it's been a blessing for you. This is a wonderful psalm. Don't forget it. Take it home with you. Because one of these days you're going to need it. And it's a good one. It's not a long one, but it's a good one. Thank you. And we'll see you next time we get together. By the way, don't, let me remind you that Wednesday, if the weather holds up and doesn't look like it's going to rain, we'll meet outside. So you might want to throw a chair, a lawn chair, in the back of your uh, car. And that way we can meet out there. But if it's going to rain, or appears that it might rain, then we probably won't meet outside. So we'll have to play it by ears. Ears. I got two. Dwayne's tugging on his ear. All right. God bless you, and we'll see you soon.